Hello, this is Chris McGrath of TDN, welcoming you to the start of an exciting new project, partnering with Keeneland and the University of Kentucky's Nunn Center for Oral History. We're so lucky that some of the most accomplished figures in our industry have agreed to share some memories of their lives and careers, with the great horses and horsemen they've encountered. And we're especially fortunate that the first person to give us his time is Mr. Seth Hancock of Claiborne, perhaps the most iconic bluegrass farm of all. Well, I was born into it and I was around there all my life. I mean, I never really knew anything else. People come there and they, they tell you that the place is dripping with history and, and it's moving for other folks probably more so than me because it's just, it's always been there. My grandfather started Claiborne Farm in Kentucky back in 1910, and my father built it into what it was and hopefully still is. I guess if you you got somebody in a boat and you throw them overboard, they don't want to die, so they learn how to swim. I knew all the guys on the farm. Hell, I'd been around there ever since I was a kid, and I had a good rapport with all of them because I'd worked beside them, many of them, for a long time. It's easy to go to them and say, hey, it's, this is what we got to do. We're going to sell the, these horses we're breaking. They're going to New York. We're going to sell them. All the race horses are going to be sold. We're going to sell yearlings next summer. And, you know, you just, you just go. I mean, you might go five or six years and, and lose money every year. And then a 49er comes along or a pulpit comes along or a swale comes along. But if you go too long before that one comes along, you might be out of business before he gets there. And uh, he knew selling yearlings was the right thing to do for us to put us on a firm financial foundation. And he, I mean, he wouldn't, he couldn't have known whether we were gonna sink or swim. And uh, selling yearlings would give you more time to learn how to swim. The reason he came to the farm was because of a long-standing relationship between my father and Mr. Chinnery, and then when he got sick, between my father and, and Miss Tweedy. You know, I was just in the right place at the right time. The cake was pretty well baked, but Lord knows that was some mighty sweet icing on top of it, and to be sitting there watching it, it's almost like this can't be. I mean, you know, just to keep widening and widening, and it, it was jaw-dropping, it truly was. And then you look at the teletimer and see how fast he ran. It's like, whew, I, I can't believe what I just saw. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish 25 lengths in front. Got lucky right off the bat, and Secretariat came in there, and, um, you know, and then we were able to kind of keep adding some stands and do okay, and then, of course, got. Danzig and Mr. Prospector came there in 80 and they carried us for a long, long time. And about the time they were kind of getting old and here comes Pulpit. And about the time he was getting old, here comes Warfront. And now he's getting old and hopefully run happy or somebody else is gonna pick up the ball and run with it. When I made that decision, they said, Seth, you sure you know what you're doing? He's awful young. I said, you know, I don't want to listen to that young crap. I said, he's a year older than I was when I started, plus I will still be, be around, and my father wasn't. And uh, he doesn't rely on me much. He doesn't need to, because he knows what he's doing. But I think in the back of his mind, knowing, well, you know, if something happens here, I can always go ask him what I need to do, then I think that's probably comforting. At least I hope it is.